Hello and welcome to the latest edition of the Keep Bright On podcast. I'm Alex Dickin and I'm as ever joined by Brian Dick. And this week we're joined by BBC WM's blues reporter Richard Wilford to discuss briefly the West Brom game, moving on to the Sheffield Wednesday game on Friday and a hell of a lot in between, including your questions and takes. Firstly, uh, thanks for coming on, Richard. Uh, we'll start with your uh, assessment of the Albion game, I think, to get us up and running. Yeah, I mean, a slightly frustrating afternoon, wasn't it, overall? And I think the first half showed some promise without too many clear chances. I thought the second half, I know that Tony Mowbray was reasonably content with the substitutes, but I didn't think that they improved what was going on. I think the loss of Pritchard at half time didn't help the flow of the game. I thought they got a bit passive, actually, in the end. And other than that, very unlucky chance for Kevin Long. We reached the point where I think the goal was coming. By the time that it did, there was going to be one chance for Albi, wasn't there, towards the end of the game, and they took it. So, you know, I think perhaps also frustration they couldn't react at that point. One nil down didn't look like producing a grandstand finish. Brian, I'm guessing you concur with that. Yeah, I'd agree. Uh, Albion had two chances as well, didn't they? They not only the goal, but they yeah. had the, the Mowat header as well, um, which probably should should he should have scored. Um, I agree. I, I think what my main takeaway was, uh, yes, Blues had quite a quite a bit of, of attacking quality on the pitch, um, but I was really impressed with West Brom's defence. I've got to say, um, you know, Furlong shackled Dembele. Um, Stansfield didn't get much change out, out of their back too, um, albeit one of their back they should the one of their centre backs should have gone with with that um, kick uh, with that that pull back on Dembele. They didn't get much joy down down the down the righty or down the blues right and, and their left. Connor Townsend kept that pretty shut. So I, I think I came away th- f- again seeing yes, you can see what Mowbray's trying to do. Cr- trying to do. Yes, they've cut. They've they've taken a team with a really good home record, very close, and they've largely contained them. Um, but yeah, as Richard said, they've not really created anything. And you know, had the had the um, Kevin Long chance gone in. You know, you can't honestly say that Blues had really done enough to be 1-0 up, but then, you know, that's largely irrelevant whether you do or not or not, isn't it? Mm, yeah, I think Mowbray bemoaned the defence, defending for that for that goal after the match. Um, who do you think was couple there? Because obviously there was a change at left-back with Ethan Laird going over to that side. It came down that side with Furlong. Um, and obviously Christian Bielik and Kevin Long slightly out of position. Bielik has to try and come across and couldn't get there in time in the middle to, to stop Wyman putting it in the, the near post. Um, Richard, who do you think the blame lies with for that one? I felt he was pointing the finger at Kevin Long a little bit because I think his job was the near post. I think we have to believe that the substitution was kind of enforced on Buchanan coming off as well. I don't yeah. think it was a tactical change necessarily. Buchanan, we may recall, suffered a concussion a few weeks ago and missed a couple of games. He had a bang on the head about four or five minutes before his substitution. So I suspect, I mean, I didn't ask Tony Mowbray about that after the game, but I imagine he's gone off as a precaution. I don't know whether he was asked in the main press conference about it. Um, and yeah, so I don't, I think you look at the attacking talent that they've got, and when they push the fullbacks forward, they're going to be a danger. It's probably the only time, other than the moment header that Brian referred to, it's the only other time that Blues lost a man in the box. Because I thought they actually defended really well. I thought long alongside being it was pretty good at the back up until that point. Mm, yeah. Um, moving on from the, from the from the game itself now, and at the end of the game, towards the end of the game, there was obviously an incident involving Janino Bakuna again, similar to the game against Huddersfield back at St Andrews in October. Uh, Bakuna alleged that someone in the home section this time racially abused him. Obviously, it's not the first time this happened. Not the first time you know this happened in 2024 with that Casey Palmer incident at uh, at Hillsborough playing for Coventry City a few weeks ago. Um, Brian, can you just run us, run us through and the people listening what happened and kind of in those final five minutes because that, that Bakuna incident seemed to be the trigger for, for a mad end to the match and obviously when the final whistle went, it all kicked off. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if, if the Bakuna allegation and what happened at the end of the match or actually direct correlation, you know, there, there were other incidents that happened after the final whistle, mm. like Andy Vyman going up and, you know, taunting the Blues fans um, and, you know, a couple of the Albion fans getting at Jay Stans, uh, Albion players getting at Jay Stansfield as well. And, J- and JJ got himself into a bit of a tangle with Furlong, didn't he? So there was something going on there. I, I wouldn't want to say for a second that that was related to what Bakuna had reported. But yeah, the, um, the game had just um, 
just started into I think it was seven or eight minutes of added time, um, mm. and and then obviously the the temperature was building because Albion had not long scored and Blues were searching for an, an equaliser, and the perce- and the perception was that it was Bakuna was wasting time, but obviously he came to, he came to the sideline, he spoke to the referee, he spoke to the fourth official. He very clearly gesticulated back towards the area of the, of the ground that that he, that something had allegedly happened. Um, and yes, very, very quickly afterwards, both managers conf- confirmed that uh, an allegation had been made. Both clubs have uh, uh, released statements con- condemning the action, and, and that's all you can do, isn't it? It's it in just it's just a horrible thing for for someone to have to go through. Particular and poor poor backers had to has experienced it twice and i think he also had a negative experience on social media as well when he was uh, playing for the curacao national team mm. so yeah just there's just no place in it for the game in the game at all and uh, and i would say you know if if it is proven and uh, clearly whoever did it wasn't wasn't um, paying attention at the start of the game when albion put up uh, po- posted an image of Cyril Regis uh, and, and Larry Cunningham and Brendan Batson. You know, I don't. I'm not very comfortable calling them the three degrees, but that's that's how are they? That's how how they're, they're sort of known in in club folklore. Um, but yeah, that was obviously a, a, a you know a message about stamping out um, any form of, uh, of of racism or um, from from football. So yeah, you know, West Brom have got a, a pretty proud history. Of, uh, of 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 champ- championing um, players of of, of of BMA BAME players, um, so yeah, hugely regrettable and uh, you know just just damn right wrong. Mm. Um, there were there are obviously other incidents and uh, afterwards as well. Um, moving on from that that Bakuna Bakuna incident now, um, the the Wyman thing, Brian. We spoke about this earlier. Um, how do you, how do you guys feel about the Wyman incident? Because he you know he's he's, he's goaded the away fans, hasn't he? He's got in front of them and goaded him after scoring. They're giving him a bit of stick when he's come on. Um, it's it's kind of commonplace in football. It happens a lot, doesn't it? Um, my only issue with it, I think, was that you know in the in the tensions that existed between the fans, obviously situated right next to each other in that Smethwick end stand, based on what had happened the previous week at the Hawthorns with you know West Brom and Wolves fans, where it all obviously kicked off. And that it was, you know, it reached ball input on the field. I don't think it was needed. I don't think it was the wisest move. It could have obviously set something a whole lot bigger than, you know, players pushing each other off in the stands. Uh, yeah, it certainly wasn't needed. Um, you, we made reference before this, didn't we, that, you know, to, to Dion Sanderson uh, celebrating in front of the Albion fans in, in, mm. the, in the game in St Andrews. Um before it was St Andrews at Nighthead Park. Um, yeah, uh, what I would say about the Sanderson incident is is that was during the game, and he was right in front of them. The Vyman thing came after the game, and it's it's obviously you know it's not a rush of emotion in in the in the way that you know there's this massive outpouring when he score a goal. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't suppose Vyman was thinking about for a second about the um, the, the the public order. Um, consequences of what he might do, and, and and the context of what had happened at the Hawthorns last week. This was a, this was a guy that had, you know, had, had been given a bit of stick because of his Villa past, and he scored the winning goal. Um, just even so, at, at that point, you know, for me, his job's complete. He's he said everything he needs to say. He scored the winning goal, and you, going towards the away fans is not helpful. Um, so yeah, that that that's my view on it. Really, um, I don't suppose he'll fi- face any action. He's probably he hasn't done anything wrong, has he? I, d- I don't think, uh, other, other than something in by- what I would describe to be as a little bit silly. Mm. Yeah. Um, moving on to the uh, the three debutants or full debutant in the case of Andre Dazelle. Um Dazelle played ninety minutes. Pritchard, Alex Pritchard played the first half, and uh, Peck Sung Ho played around 30 minutes, I think, by the end of uh, added time. Richard, what were your first initial assessments of uh, of Dazelle on his first start for the club? 
Yeah, I thought he, I thought he was the it was the best performance of the three debutants overall. Mm. With the caveat that the most exciting was Peck uh, because we saw his energy, we saw his athleticism, we saw his quality. But but Dazelle is exactly what Tony Mowbray said he was going to be: somebody who can play in that holding role, is keen to get the ball forward quickly. He uses it very effectively. He'll pass it to a more skillful player. His delivery of set pieces was a bonus because there was a lot of talk before the game about Pritchard being brought in for set pieces, but it was Dazelle's corner that was flicked onto the post by Kevin Long, so you can see the quality of the delivery there. He's got that little bit about him of midfield rat willing to put the, the foot in and that sort of thing. And I think he's going to go down really well over the rest of the season at St Andrews as well. I just think he, he is as advertised. He's, he's a lovely age at 24, 170 games under his belt. He has learned how to play that position. It's the position that actually you need a bit of experience in. I thought, actually, he and Sunic together, without the ball, were very good. Dazel was good with the ball as well. You can see what I'm pointing at. But but you know what I mean? I thought Dazel used the ball very effectively. Don't go there, Richard. That's a, that's a Brian Dick special, that is. Um, <laughs> um, I, th- I just I was really impressed that he never he never seemed rushed in possession at all. Did he? He was collecting it from the centre backs and and moving forward. And you can say that Albion weren't pressing him a great deal at times, but good players tend to have time, don't they? And, and Dazelle, especially in the first half, I think Brian he had a lot of time, didn't he? Yeah, he did. Um, I, I I was impressed. I, I suppose I came in expecting. An awful lot. Tony Mowbray described his, uh, you know, him as having a wand of a left foot, and and you 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 kind of, you know, no no one's ever a bad player when they're signed, are they? So I get I get that Mowbray was going to say he's he's a good player, and he and he talks him up a little bit. Um, yeah, I th- I I don't think he let himself down. I wasn't blown away, if I'm honest. What I would say was encouraging was outside of um, Christian Bielik, I think it was, uh, who obviously had the ball off, off the goalkeeper more. Dazelle had the most touches of all the Blues players and his, his, his completion rate was pretty good, something up like 50, 85%. And as Richard said, he was trying to pass the ball forward, so that makes it even better. Um, yeah, I, I, I can see why Mowbray brought him in. Um, and I think pairing him with someone like uh, JJ um, in, a, in a game where Blues are going to have more possession and... You know they're not necessarily going to be um, as, as up against the such good opposition central midfielders that then I think Blues can afford to be a little bit more sort of um, ambitious with that with the choice of second central midfielder. But yeah, just, but, but, so, we, we, we should ask the central question, boys: Is this is he better in that position than what Tony Mowbray inherited? And I would say, on the evidence of his first start, he clearly is definitely in possession. Yeah, I mean. The central midfield is mean, the one area in the in the transfer that was improved drastically. Uh, I, I I really like the look of him, to be honest. And I know you know the criticism will be that he didn't find a killer pass or didn't put someone through on goal or uh, you know put a winger in down the down the channel. But I was I was really impressed with the way he probed and and pressed. And um, I think he'll, I think he'll be a good sign. And to be honest, I'm I'm probably more excited about him now, having seen him play a game for Blues, than I was before that game at the Hawthorns. And you talked about the, how good Albion were defensively. I mean, Miyoshi was almost unfindable at times because Townsend yeah. was doing a good number on him. Mm. And Dem- Dembele, let's not duck it, was at his most frustrating in that he was carrying the ball really effectively. He got into good positions. Then he would run into a brick wall or the opening would go. Just the one occasion when he was through potentially on goal and got held back by Kipre. But, but you know, if, if your wide players are having a tough day, it's really hard for Dezel to make the killer ball, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. It it wasn't a it certainly wasn't a vintage attacking display by Blues. Um, yeah, you're right, and you know I credit Albion with that a lot. I have to, I have to say I think they're a fantastically organised football team. Um, at the risk of sounding like Tony Mowbray, I would suggest. Um, yeah, I, yeah, Dazel. I agree. Dazel did nothing wrong. It's uh, it, he he looks. He, he keeps the ball and moves it forward, and and that's that's why Mowbray's got him at, got him at the club, isn't it? Yeah, Alex Pritchard had to go off at half time with a with a tight calf. Um, Tony Mowbray didn't seem particularly concerned about that after the game. He, he, I thought he looked quite sharp actually in the in the first fifteen twenty minutes in terms of the way he was dropping off the full off off Jay Stansfield and picking up you know nice little positions in behind Okay Yakushlu and and Alex Mower. 
um, and finding the ball. He obviously set that st- that chance up for Jay Stansfield, didn't he? That half chance where he shot from distance on a nice break that Blues made away. Um, but there's obviously a lot more to come from him. That was probably, you know, probably one of his most least effective performances this season. I, I can imagine of all his 24 games in the league, I think it is. But, you know, he he also showed signs of promise, didn't he? Uh, yeah, I yeah I quite liked him. I've got to say, um, I thought uh, I actually I quite liked him without the ball. On you know he he's, he sort of won a couple of sneaky turnovers quite early in the game as well. So so you know I was um, I, I was I, I was really intrigued to see what he what he um, he will bring. What you would say is he gets the ball under control very quickly, and he um, he, he gets his head up and looks for teammates as as well. Um, we, as Rich, as, as we said, we didn't see a huge amount of him from from a set piece point of view. Um, but yeah, I, I'm, I wonder if Blues Blues probably would have been better in the second half had Pritchard still still been on the pitch. Don't you think? Yeah. Uh, but one, of the, one of the reasons for that is that I don't think anybody really replaced him position wise. The assumption was that Jordan James would play as the ten, but actually played deeper and a bit yeah. to the left. Mm, so yeah. it was almost a hole where Pritchard was playing. Now. You know, I'm going to be honest, you two already know this, I'm in the Pritchard sceptic camp in terms of the signing because a 30-year-old on a two-and-a-half-year contract, his track record in terms of goals and assists over his career is, is OK, but he's had some down spells as well. So for me, I was watching with quite a critical eye, and I would agree with Brian that his off-the-ball work was very good and that his part in the press is fundamental to the way that Tony Mowbray wants to play, and I thought he did a good job of that. There were times that Albion, who were quite comfortable on the ball, got quite skittish during the course of the first half in particular. The second half, in terms of the, the going forward bit in the first half, I'll give him a bit of a free pass because I thought Tony Mowbray made a good point in the pre-match press conference that it will take Pritchard a while to work out who to give the ball and when. He's got to actually learn about his teammates and how to get the very best out of them. Mm. And he'd, he'd had barely any time on the training ground to do it. So for me, his import is going to come in these next few games now because it we are, as we're going to sure talk, we'll talk about in a bit, approaching a really significant part in Tony Mowbray's first you know, couple of months in that there are matches now that they need to be winning. What did you think, Alex, of Pritchard? Because, you know, by, by the by the time the second half comes along, your head's down and you're you're typing for 45 <laughs> minutes pretty much, aren't you? But, yeah. So, so, so you've got more chance to look up and see the first half. What, what did you make of it? Yeah, I, I actually like the idea. He seemed to drift over to the left a little bit. in Almost like a, a kind of... Wait, where you said Jordan James played second half, he was probably slightly ahead of that at times at various points in the first half and trying to link with Dembele. I thought he missed it. He got into that position well, took the ball back from Dembele and then had the option to play Stansfield over the top at one stage and he missed it. Um, you know, that'll obviously, like Richard said, that's a kind of a timing thing and getting used to your teammates, isn't it? And that will obviously come. Um, I was... I was a little bit disappointed with some, with some of his set pieces, the corners that he took from that left-hand side. Uh, I thought Dazelle probably did a better job from the other flank. Mm. But, um, but yeah, it's uh, it's probably going to take him a week or two to get up to speed and get used to these players. But I, I think that'll be a probably... That's the sign that I'm expecting to be the, the instant hit. I think he'll... Well, should be on paper, the guy who comes in and really impresses between now and the end of the season. Whereas the other two, I think, will be good signings over the longer term. Mm. Um I wanted to come on to Sung Ho Peck. Um, I've got it right in the pronouncement that time, I think. Um, but uh, on on him, Richard, you were you were impressed with him. I know you were in that in that twenty five minute cameo. He started right wing after coming on for Miyoshi, played left wing, and then moved into into midfield at the end of the game. Um, what did you make of him? Uh, look, far better than I expected. I was I actually found his performance quite thrilling at times, uh, and he was the high point of the final twenty minutes. Uh, he has got great wheels on him. He really can move. When he's on the ball, he moves with pace and power. His reading of the game looked very, very good. You know, as a physical specimen, he's bigger and stronger than I expected him to be, given that he's had a rather checkered career up to the age of 26. He's, he's only in South Korean football, ultimately, he's managed to establish himself. He looks to me like a guy who's going to open up defences and will get his fair share of goals as well, used correctly. Clearly, Tony Mowbray is very high on the guy. I think he will have an impact this season. I really do. And, and he may even be the sort of player who, in, in an emergency, could play through the middle if they need it. You know, if Jay Stansford has an injury, and there's a real question 
as to what Blues have got behind him as a nine. Peck has got a little bit of everything. I also saw him put his foot in a couple of times as well. So mm. for, for, for me, as a cameo, it was really, really encouraging. And I know that it'll take a while for him to get up to full speed. Hadn't played until the, since December the 3rd, I think it was. But, but I thought that was the signing that really caught the eye for me. And in terms of what the upside, the ceiling, I think, is really high on that lad. Mm. I was I was very much head down at that point when he came on, but I did see a few little bits. I mean, the corner from the from the left that Stansfield flicked on and Kevin Long couldn't, couldn't quite get on the end of. Um, that was a decent delivery. And also there was one switch of play from left to right that found Bakuna in, in acres of space as well. So he looks like he's got a few kind of... Um, Irons in in his uh, in his case there. Um, he's, he looks a really really useful player, I think, and it'll be interesting to actually see where he fits in, where he plays, because Blues have got a lot of midfield options now. They've obviously got a lot of players who can play in those three positions behind the striker. Brian, where do you reckon he'll play when he gets his first start? Could be a couple of weeks away now. Um, where do I reckon he'll play? I would say he could. I think you could pick you pick him in any of the. F- any five positions really i probably wouldn't play him as the full as as sort of the stansfield nine false nine kind kind of thing i could see him i could see him playing across the the attacking three i could equally see him playing in 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 the double pivot um what i liked about him was was the way he handled the ball um you know he, he we made reference to good players having time and he he certainly seemed to have that um i think i think richard's right i think his versatility uh, it, you know, is 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 really high level because I, I think he because he he's probably a bit of a next level kind of player for Blues, and um, certainly better than what we've seen, you know, patrolling those areas of the pitch in the last two or three years. So, yeah, really really exciting, but not one that necessarily screams a, a definite position just yet. Mm. Yeah, although I would say you look at what Mowbray did at Blackburn and what he was doing at Sunderland, the position that he played. Armstrong, Brereton, Jack Clark. Coming off the left-hand side, he could equally come off the right-hand side. I think that's the position that Mowbray sees him in. He has that little bit of physicality, which he likes in those wide players. Not so much Armstrong. He's a little wee lad, isn't he? But, but the other two are big, bigger, stronger characters. He's got that bit of pace. And I think Tony Mowbray could be the key to unlocking goals in this guy's career. But for me, it's going to be wide in the three that he's going to play. Probably off the left. Interesting. What does that mean for Dembele, then, do you think? It, it'll have to be less gloomy about playing on the right. <laughs> and he'll have, to, he'll, have to do his, he'll have to do his defensive duty as well, won't he? Mowbray's already identified that, hasn't he? And, and, and I believe spoken to him about, you know, do the other side of the game as well, Denver, otherwise you won't play. So, uh, yeah, the ball yeah. is very yeah. much firmly in Dembele's court on that one. And there's enough football ahead that they're all going to get plenty of starts, to be honest. There's, mm-hmm. there's so much football left to play between now and the start of May. Yeah, and there's the the ever present ghoul of the uh, calf strain as well, isn't there? So I'm sure, I'm, without wishing injury on any, on anybody, uh, yeah. you know, I, I'm sure they won't all be fit at the same time. Yeah. Um, nevertheless, it was it was another defeat at the Hawthorns of Blues, and um, they are now 19th in the league with 32 points. They've got a game in hand of the four teams directly below them in the in the Championship table. But, you know, some of those teams are picking up points. QPR have taken seven points from three games. So now it's just four points uh, between Blues and the relegation places. Brian, we spoke about this earlier and you wanted to you wanted to address it on the podcast. Uh, you can go go first. Are, are Blues in a relegation scrap here? Not yet. No. Um, they've got some difficult games coming up beyond uh, Sheffield Wednesday and Blackburn at home. Uh, th- those two are really important matches for me, and if if Blues can return four points from from that, and listen, we've seen promise uh, and 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 potential and sort of coherence and and a pattern to play what that Mowbray's trying to introduce. Um, th- that said, they are going to need to produce points as well, and if they can produce sort of four points from those next two games, uh, then you know I, I think it's a it's a fairly comfortable. Um, downhill, downhill jog to the to 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 the finishing line and seeing how how far up the up the table I can get. However, if they don't take a decent amount of points from the next two, uh, and then they go into um, Sunderland, Ipswich, Southampton, and Hull, you know, need needing needing you know th- threes rather than ones, if you know what I mean, then I th- I'd like to be asked that question again. Uh, bearing in mind also what what the teams below them do. 
Yeah, Richard, um, Blues have got 32 points. We normally think it needs about 50 to stay up. That's uh, that's six more wins in the final 17 games. This squad's got enough for that, hasn't it? Yeah, well, five wins and a handful of draws. I'll take it that mm. way as well. Look, the squad should have enough in it. They're not in a relegation battle now, I agree. If they don't win either of the next two games, they will be because because of the fixtures that Brian has just mentioned. And, the, you know, you don't want to be playing Southampton anywhere just at the moment because yeah. they are properly in the groove now. Russell Martin has got them singing. Ipswich away is a different sort of game. I think there is, there is potential to get something out of that. It's a bit like playing at Albion. I think the new signings that Ipswich have brought in may just discombobulate them a little bit. But these two games now coming up, man, I think Friday night's enormous. I mm. really do. And they, they have the potential with the forward talent to get a big result out of that. And it, it's about getting at Sheffield Wednesday night and early. If Sheffield Wednesday get a good start, then you do fear a little bit about a group where there's still a number of players who've been through it again and again and again. Mm. Well, Sheffield Wednesday, I mean, when we look back to November when Blues played them, and obviously they'd just had about a month or six weeks under, under Danny Roll at the time, they'd picked up a little bit, but they still only had, what, 10, 11 points? And everyone was talking about them as one of the worst championship teams ever. They've picked up considerably under him, not enough to get themselves out of the relegation zone. But they've got 23 points. They're nine behind Blues. Obviously, a win would make that six. Um, should we be fearing, fearing Sheffield Wednesday, Brian? Not by the way they defended against Huddersfield Town the, the, the other day. Um, they, they've they've got players in their team that can that can hurt um, Blues, and if they get the first goal, as Richard says, then you know it sets it sets the nerves jangling a little mm. bit, doesn't it? Uh, you know, and 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 maybe you know the 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 battle fatigue starts to starts to um, to rear its head, head again in, in in some of those Blues Blues minds, um, but if you know the way the way Blues played. I thought against Albion and the way they ha the way they played in the first half against Leicester and the and the couple of results they've, they've picked up under Mowbray prior to that makes me think they have they have enough to 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 beat Sheffield Wednesday. Albeit the the home the away record isn't great. Um, and I think if they do that, they you know they're they're off and running and and they're probably a lot more comfortable in their own skins. Uh, but I, I do agree with Rich that that. You know, lose, losing at Hillsborough does make everyone start to feel a bit wobbly. Um, but you know, I watched the highlights of of of, of, of uh, Wednesday's loss to lost four 0 loss to Huddersfield, and our old friend Christian Pedersen was um, was up to his old antics again. Get you know, getting getting too far underneath the diagonal and, and letting Sorba Thomas in, and then then the, the fourth goal, Sheffield um, Huddersfield go. Literally, they're they're in the in the um, in the the Sheffield Wednesday penalty box for about for about six seconds, and this, and no one's coming back. And you know, I, I number Pedersen and, and other defenders amongst that as well. It was a bit like the Coventry City goal where he, he for when he played for Blues, and he ended up tying his shoelace as uh, as 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 Callum O'Hare was taking pot shots at, at, at Blues goal. Um, yeah, I, I, I definitely, Blues can definitely win, win there. Yeah, they, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty confident. Uh, but for, it's, it's one of those games where, where first goal is absolutely key. Yeah, we are recording this podcast before the press conference, so we're not a hundred percent on team news and things like that. As a bit of a disclaimer, um, Richard, what are you thinking team, team wise against Sheffield Wednesday? I can't imagine it be too much different from the one we saw last weekend, to be honest. I, th I think at the moment that, that front four is the front four he wants to play. Mm. So as long as Pritchard is fit, if he isn't fit, I think you've got an interesting question there. Is Bakuna going to step up into that three? Uh, I think there is the potential to do that. Miyoshi could play as the 10. Um, I think the two holders, I, I mean, the, the question is Jordan James, isn't it? Now, Mowbray admitted that Jordan James is really unlucky not to play the game at the weekend. But he also has a slight issue at the moment with leadership in that, Mm. With no Djukovic, no Ruddy, Dion Sanderson as captain out, Ivan Sunic is kind of the senior player in the squad. So you can see why the last two matches he's worn the captain's armband. It's not obvious to know who it goes to next as well in terms of, of leading. And I don't know that Ivan's the most vocal, by the way. I don't think there are many vocal mm. players left in the team. But it may be it's very difficult at the moment to see how he slides Jordan James in again unless he does it into the attacking three. And for me... You know, the way that Jordan played the second half on Saturday, where he, for me, he was deeper than he should have been. I'm not convinced that still he wants to play in that position. I think it's still a bit of a, 
a battle to, to go as to, to what position Jordan James is going to be playing in. So I can't see it being very much different. Do you not play him as a six, though, Richard? You could do, but who are you leaving out? Because he's not leaving out Dazelle. Mm. Yeah. And if suddenly she's going to captain the side, and that's the problem he's got at the moment. Mm. Give, give the captaincy to Long and and go with JJ and uh, and, and Dazelle, potentially. Um, I, I wonder if Jay... Listen, we're, we're, we're all pretty large to varying degrees of JJ fans here. It, the, the position... His best position is still not resolved, is it? And you know, and I, I, I wonder if it's a case of having too many options. You, you, you know, he's he, he can play six, he can play eight, he could potentially play ten. I'm not a massive lover of him, him as a ten, but six, six and eight, you know, I think he plays them both largely equally well. Um, so is, is it a case of developing him in, in both positions as, as we go forward, or or do, do you think there will come a time in his life where he, he just has to? They'll say I am this or I am that. I, I think he's in a bit of a similar position to what he was at the start of the season at John Hughes, and the formation Blues are playing again now. Probably it doesn't allow him to play as an eight, does it? And I think we all we are all in agreement is eight's probably where he's been most effective this season. You know, when he was playing in that those games under Rooney as an eight, and he was scoring goals. Um, I thought that got the most out of him. Uh, I was impressed with him in the first couple of games. Under Mowbray, when he played against Swansea, came off the bench and I thought he did quite well as a six against Stoke. I think six is better than 10 for JJ. Um, but I think eight's probably the perfect role for him. And in this system at the moment, he's not, you know, he's not able to play there, is he? Because it doesn't exist in this system. Hmm. Yeah, it's, it's a funny thing. So I'm not, not for a moment comparing them as a standard of player, but it's much the same debate that we were having about Jude Bellingham in yeah. his one season at Blues. And the, the reality is, what Jordan James is, is a really capable, versatile footballer who can play pretty much any position he wants to, some better than others. I mean, for me, defensively, there's still a lot of work to do in terms of his positioning, about blocking the passing lanes, at times about tracking runners. And that's the thing that he's having to learn in the six. He's done it very effectively for Wales. We know that. But I think those are the, those are the bits of the game that Tony Mowbray would be more concerned about. As an attacking player, I think he's very mature. He makes good decisions. He's a great striker of the ball. So... Right now, I think he sits better somewhere within the three than he does as a six, but he's probably more likely to start as a six. Hmm. Mm. I, I was I was tiptoeing around that comparison, but it, it absolutely was where I was going. Um, yeah, just just the sheer versatility and the the potential and the skill set to play different positions. You, yeah, I, I agree. He's another twenty two, isn't he? Um, <laughs> um, moving on to the takes. Uh, I think Richard's going to like this one. From Mark, starting to look so much more comfortable in possession and Dazel was brilliant with getting his head up and passing forward. Didn't create loads, but we were a match for a side in the top six. Completely switched off for the goal, but overall a positive performance. Um, Richard, do you want to go with that one? Well, I mean, he's seen the same from Andre Dazel. And the, the comment that Tony Mowbray made three weeks ago, you'll have heard it, Alex. I think it's, it's really, really important to stress this. He's one of the players that have been brought in because Tony Mowbray wanted people in who could demonstrate to the other players on the training ground what he really requires from them. Mm. Dazell and Pritchard are absolutely the two players that fit that mantle. And I think Dazell demonstrated to Sunjic, to Bielik, if he ever went back into that position, and to Jordan James, this is how my double pivots need to play on the half turn looking forward. Yeah, it's mm. not about three to three touches and pirouettes, is it? It really isn't. It's about getting the ball. For, and actually, I think JJ did that quite well against Leicester as well, um, mm. under, under under quite a lot of a lot of duress with some of the balls that came into his feet. Yeah, no, agreed. Um, one from Pink Panther, Christian Bielik. Just my opinion, but what do you gain on playing out from the back? Sorry, but what you gain on playing out from the back, you lose in regards to defensive mobility and awareness. There's been a couple of occasions already where he's left players unmarked. The Bielik experiment in defence, I suppose it's having mixed results, isn't it? Um, I thought he was quite good against Stoke. I thought he was very good against Hull, actually, in the first game after he'd made the mistake for the for the Hull goal. I thought he was quite good against Stoke. I thought there were a few occasions where he played passes out from the back that wouldn't have been spotted by a centre-back, and I think he did that against Leicester as well. Um, granted, he was partly to blame for the first goal Leicester scored in that game. Um, I don't think he did much wrong against West Brom. And he was playing a slightly different role, don't forget, because he was playing on the right side of Kevin Long rather than, you know, on the left side when 
as we know, when Blues attack, they become a back three. And the guy on the left side of defence, which is normally Christian Bielik, sits between two more mobile, faster players, i.e. Lee Buchanan and Dion Sanderson. Yeah, I'm really confused about the Bielik thing. Not because I, I think he's a great centre-back. I think he's a really good centre-back. I think he's playing quite well. But this current trope about his mobility is overstated to a ridiculous degree. Are you telling me he's much less mobile than Kevin Long? He isn't. He palpably mm. isn't. Well, his problem in, in midfield is the speed with which he moves the ball, not the speed with which he moves his legs. He actually covers quite a bit of ground because he's got long legs. And also he's in a team where there's a lot of quick players. And we've talked for years about Blues having no pace. There's bundles of pace around this team now, which we've mm. been quite unaccustomed to. And I just think it's a really odd thing at the moment. Everybody's latching on to the idea that Bielik is slow. He isn't. He's got good speed of thought as well. And his positioning at centre-back is great. All he's having to do is relearn playing there all the time. And some of the things that he hasn't had to do for three or four years. But I, I, I would persist with him as a centre-back. I have no issue. He, he's, he's probably in the top two centre-backs at the club. Yeah. Do you think so? Gosh. Right. I, 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 I don't feel that he defends as an instinctive defender. You know, I'm not, I'm not massively convinced by the way he, tra he tracks strikers' runners. It, it, you know, the little the little two-yard darts to the near post or the, the ones where they just pull off to the centre spot or the um, penalty spot. Um, I'm not convinced he's, he's totally um, up with those nuances yet. It, it doesn't strike me as, an, as a natural, natural, natural centre back, but I think he... I think he could he could learn it, and that's probably what you said, Richard. Is it, it, it's going to take him time to become a, yeah. attuned to that? If you took him since he was fourteen, I bet he's played more years at centre back than at centre mid. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think the key thing we have to remember here is that Tony Mowbray is building towards a team that's going to have you know a lot of possession, and if they have a lot of possession, playing Christian Bielik at, at centre back isn't going to make you know a lot of a different a lot of difference in terms of. How he performs defensively, yes, he's going to have to man mark strikers, but the the main aim of his game will be to bring the ball out and play play forward passes, won't it? And if he can do it more more comfortably from there than he can in midfield, then I, I think he'll be an asset as a centre back. I mentioned to you, Brian, actually before about the uh, the Sunderland team that Mowbray had, and you know how in game I think in some of the games against Luton in the playoff semi finals last year, they didn't actually play with a recognised centre back. You know, they played with a left back and a and a centre midfielder. For one of the games, a centre back actually they played a back three. One of the guys was also a winger, so they didn't play with a natural centre back. And I think Mowbray obviously values players that are more comfortable on the ball and can play passes forward in those positions. Yes, they still need to defend, and yes, you know that was evident in the in the goal they conceded against West Brom. But I think Bielik's done okay. I think he's done as as well as any other centre back he's played alongside in the four games that he's been in that position. It's a work in progress, and you know we've not we've not it's not been a disaster to the extent where you'd stop the experiment now, has it? Mm. Um, and it was the it was the experienced centre back who got beaten to the near post. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good point you make. Um, moving on to John Ramsey's take. Um, so <laughs> it's, it's another Bielik one, to be fair. Uh, with you on this, Bielik is not a natural defender. At fault for the WBA goal, when all fit, prefer Sanderson and Long. Let them play into midfield. We now have enough footballers in there who can play the ball forward. I think, to be fair, probably, I know Richard, you said Kevin Long was the guy at fault for the goal. I think both are partly to blame because... Wyman had moved on to Bielik hadn't he, and ran across him, but you're right in that it was it was Long's position at the near post that he didn't cover. Yeah. Yeah. It was. And, and also, is, is, who's John proposing started ahead of him? Ivy or Mark Roberts? Because that's your choice. That's your choice. Yeah, yeah I, was, I, was, I was a little bit surprised that he didn't go with Ivy, to be honest, against Albion, in that not because I think Ivy is a better defender than Kevin Long, because he's definitely not, and we've said that many times, um, but just because if his speed and mobility and that it wouldn't have been as much of a change because Bielik could have stayed in the same position on the left side and Ivo could have been next to him on the right. And also I actually thought first half against Leicester, Ivo probably put in one of his better displays in, in terms of his distribution after a, the first 10 minutes where he killed Jordan James, the couple of passes, I actually thought he was, he was okay. I don't, I don't think he'll come into the team at Sheffield Wednesday. I think he'll stick with Kevin Long while, while Sanderson's out. Yeah, although John's point was he wants Bielik out. So you so would have had Long with either Ivo or Roberts, presumably. 
Because he, he doesn't think Bielik should be playing there. So I'm, I'm curious about that. Hmm. I think we're we're all team Bielik at the moment, I think. Um, yeah, on to Coop 8517. Window went fine. We have a decent enough squad to be able to roll through to the summer, which is massive. All the out-of-contract players should go, bar maybe Ruddy as a backup. We f- need first and foremost our target to be a mobile centre-forward and a keeper. Brian? Yeah, there's lots in that. Um, I Thanks for coming on, Coops. Appreciate your, uh, your input. Um, yeah, I think the squad is decent enough. I, I like the expression of rolling through to the summer. Uh, I think that's good as long as they get three points against um, against Sheffield Wednesday or Blackburn. Um, th- yeah, the, the squad is good enough. The co- out of contract players, we we keep prom- promising an episode on on treating on doing the out of contract players, don't we? So I'm I'm trying to keep my powder dry a little bit about talking about the out, out of contract players, uh, but we spoke. I expressed that I didn't think Sonia should be kept um, last week. I'm not a million miles away from Coops on, on his take about Ruddy being the one that um, that, that maybe you'd, you'd keep as a goalkeeper. And mm. yes, absolutely. In terms of in terms of the looking at the summer window, um, both both goal, goal, goalkeepers are out of contract, and um, Hogan and Djukovic are out of contract, and Stansfield goes back. So. Uh, absolutely, it's the, it's the opposite ends of the field that that, that need addressing. Mm. No, a lot going on. Um, on to the questions, and this first question coming in from Patrick Fay. Brian has told me this is another one that's going to lead to a, a wider podcast. Uh, realistic <laughs> striker targets for the summer trans window would be a great topic. I agree it would be a great topic, Patrick. Uh, but it's one I think we need to research a little bit more and have a look into rather than kind of throw a random name out there now who might not be adequate. Um, Richard, have you got any name striker that really stands out to you that you can throw out? As... Well, well, so, we'll throw so Richard you, to the wall, sorry. You, <laughs> you, you, you the question. Here's the, my, 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 don't see, you can throw a question back is, what, what's the budget? And and that, that's one mm. of the things. The great unknown at the moment is what the budget is. Tony Mowbray has already made the point that if there was any prospect of Fulham say, selling Jay Stansfield, Blue should be battering down their door and getting that deal done. So you can see that he's very keen on him. I think you need somebody with a slightly sharper lick of pace than him as your other striker. If you're going to sign Stansfield, you want somebody a little bit quicker as well. And I think that's a challenge. But I, I don't know where they're going to be shopping. I think the, the scouting network that Blues are starting to build up now is getting increasingly intriguing as well. Mm. So when you see something as left field as Peck arriving, you could reasonably expect something quite left field in terms of strikers as well. In that... that I think it's probably the first time in the best part of a decade that you feel that Blues might have something like a scouting network that can actually throw up the odd diamond. I think, you know, let's let's give credit to what Craig Gardner has brought in the last couple of years in that players like Miyoshi, getting a great deal on Dembele, getting a deal on Ethan Laird, all of those sort of things, you add a better scouting system to it. Let's wait and see what they can bring up. Yeah, it's not just a case of looking down the list of free agents and and teams that uh, players that have been released, is it? Anymore? Yeah, but players have been fa- players who failed elsewhere. You don't yeah. want that, do you? No, yeah. no. The, the net is much wider. So yeah, that 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 episode definitely does need a bit of research. Hundred <laughs> yeah. percent. Yeah, uh, Dean Manning. Predictions for youth players to break into the matchday squad this season. Once we're safe, could Tony Mowbray try Dixon or others in place of the out of contract players? Judy Dixon has come up an awful lot on this podcast. I think he's got fifteen plus goals for the under twenty ones this season. Um, he was on the bench at. Preston, I think back in September, he's uh, he's not been involved in the first team squad since. Uh, he has trained with the first team on occasions. It's a difficult one, isn't it? We've spoken about this. You know, under twenty one's goals don't really count for much when it comes to first team level, do they? They count for zero, and you yeah. know, at the risk of repeating myself, you know, we've had guys like Kyle, Kyle McFarlane and and Ronan Hale who've scored mm-hmm. bucket loads in in age groups and. Um, not even come close to getting a debut. You know, uh, Josh Andrews has just has just gone to Gillingham. Mm. Um, I thought Josh has had had a lot of raw potential. Um, maybe not a an absolute plunderer of goals, um, but similarly, you know, I don't, I don't think he even he's even made it onto a fir- into a first team squad. Am I right in saying that? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. So so yes, I suppose. I suppose. It's, it's what Lee Bowie used to do, isn't it? It, it? You know, they used to get safe with a couple of games to go, then then send a really youthful side up to Blackburn to get to get spanked. Um, so, I mean, the obvious answer is is we need to see more of Ramel, isn't it? I suppose. Mm. 
Yeah, no, I'd agree. Um, Leicester, Pyatt, it was interesting with Tony Mowbray's comments about offloading players, but also players not wanting to move, which could be looked at positively or negatively. What's your take, guys? Richard, how did you see those comments? This this is legacy from the Hong Kong era. Let's face it. Mm. There are players on ludicrous contracts that they are never going to see again in their careers. Yeah. And under those circumstances... Why would you move on? Even in a scenario, and I talked to Tony Mowbray about this, where somebody gets offered two and a half years elsewhere to leave in January, it's probably not going to make up for what they're being paid towards the end of the season. And if and it's, it's, okay, I guess it's slightly insidious to hold up one person, but if we take Scott Hogan, who's a player that Tony Mowbray has fairly quickly pushed to one side, I mean, given him one start and not being convinced by him. It's not Scott Hogan's fault that he was given this extraordinary four-year contract, which the moment it was signed, it felt like an anchor around the neck of the football club. It really did. There was nothing about Scott Hogan's performances prior to that that suggested that he needed a new four-year four -year deal. It was or that he should be signed on a four-year deal. So it isn't his fault that he's being paid that sort of money. And he is perfectly entitled to carry on. There's no way anybody was going to offer him a two-and-a-half-year contract that would entice him away early because he hasn't done well enough in the last 18 months of his career to get a great deal elsewhere. And, and there may be similar for other players. You know, you could make a case, Gary Gardner, if he wants to play football, he's going to need to be moving on. And there's a guy who would bleed for Blues, but he needs to be moving on. But again, his terms will be too good for him to walk away from before the end of, this, before the end of his deal. Yeah, there are going to be so many players, um, particularly those out of contract this, this summer, that aren't going to make match day squads between now at the end of the season, I think I worked it out. There's, there's 27 senior first team players. You know that goes into 20, doesn't it, for a match day squad? Blues have got six injuries at the moment, and still, you know, Gary Gardner, Oliver Burke, and Manny Lungello didn't make the match day squad against uh, against Albion. So, yeah, some of those players, you know, might be wishing they they had moved on in January. I don't know, but like you say, Richard, you know, it's hard to walk away from a big contract, isn't it? Especially when you're probably never going to get another one like it. Um, yeah, it, it, it's the club's fault, not the players. Yeah, yeah. Um, last question in from from Dave on uh, on X. Um, do you think a marquee American signing might happen in the future to capitalise on Brady's social media reach? I think I think it's great that fans are starting to think like this, and that's because of the bonus. This is <laughs> Brian. Are you having an American signing in the near future? Yeah, why not? Not necessarily American, just for the sake of being someone being American, but potentially someone from MLS. Yeah, I'd, I'd be very surprised if uh, if Blues weren't looking at, at, at the MLS. We know that they've taken Austin Trusty. Uh, yes, he was an Arsenal player, but his his only track record was was really with Colorado Rapids. Um, so absolutely, I'm always wary of recruiting players because of their. Um, you know they might give you an, an access to 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 a certain certain market uh i don't you know that feels a little bit like the tail wagging the dog to me uh it's first and foremost it's about getting good footballers and, and i suppose if you tell tony Mowbray you've got to play this guy because he's american and we'll get a few extra billion social media hits i don't think that's going to go down very well um but we've also said earlier in in the, in the piece that that the scouting network is wider and blues have already sort of penetrated the american market so yeah i i, I could i could see it happening absolutely yeah, yeah. Well, getting a player in because of publicity and social media breadth of influence is a bit like getting a manager in to do the same it doesn't necessarily work <laughs> does it fellas i mean i'll recently express so actually the bottom line is what they should be doing is encouraging the players to try and date adele so there we go that's my tip if you could date adele that would be really really good for insta and for tiktok so there we go yeah, Brian said a billion a billion social media hits. That for Blues equals about three million quid, doesn't it? So, so yeah, <laughs> it's pretty, it might be it might be worth it. Um, yeah, you do need note, to, you do need to be careful how you uh, you know how you advertise those um, th those new signings as well, don't you? You do, you do, yeah, Brian. Um, <laughs> if you, if you, but to, to touch on the events of last week, by the way, oh, here we go, and, and the furore <laughs> caused amongst Korean teenage girls. Can I just say this? There's not nothing wrong with parody. It, it's it wasn't done to diss anybody. It was it. I don't know. It, it felt very harmless to me. 
It's, ladies, it's and, on, ladies and gentlemen, on. at Wilford WM, please, for response no, no, to but, that one. But, but it, it's parody. <laughs> it, it's not much different from some of the things from comedy shows and dramas that are lifted. No, I, I don't indeed. know. If you look it's at the Hannib- if you look at the Hannibal signing when yeah. you know there was a there was a thirty second section of, of of Silence of the Lambs taken there wasn't there absolutely yeah it, it, it's it's not, it's it's publicity for the band as much as anything isn't it well, I would say so yeah it's got Blues nicely towards their uh, their first social media bonus of the season anyway so on that note thank you Richard very much for joining us this week thank you as ever to Brian. And uh, thank you to everyone who sent in a take, sent in a question. Really appreciate it. Hopefully, we are celebrating a fourth away win of the season for Birmingham City at Hillsborough on Friday night. It's a keep right on from all of us. Mm-hmm.